Hi, good morning. Nice to see you. This is Pastor Pete in Abundant Life Church in Lakewood, Washington. It's Thursday, the 19th of November, 2020. It's time for some coffee, like usual. You know, that's my thing. This is Coffee with Pete. I just think having a cup of coffee means that we're going to sit down together. We're going to find a mutual space. We're going to share the space, and maybe we're going to share some conversation. And like usual, I want to bring some conversation from the Word of God and I hope it encourages you. I hope if you have questions or comments or you want to dialogue with me, that you'll reach out, contact me. I'd love to have more conversation with you and more discussion. But I find it, the Word teaches us so much, and so I just want to share it with you. And it's friends that come together around a cup of coffee. So let's get, get our coffee. Get your Bible open. Get it open to the book of Acts. We're going to start in the 21st chapter, and we're going to hit a couple of spots in the 24th. But Get your Bible open to the book of Acts and get your coffee. So here we go. We've been doing a series. I have the last couple weeks, last few weeks, a series on hope. Um, and today I want to talk about hope when we disagree. Because uh, there's a lot of that in our world these days. A lot of things to disagree on. Even within the context of the church, there's things that we disagree on. And... Um, Maybe some of the strongest disagreements that we have are, the, are centered around the things that we hold closest to us. We believe most strongly. We, we, we are so desperate to be right about. And then when something comes along that challenges that, that's when our disagreements grow. Before I go too much further, though, I want to just give a very brief definition of hope. Hope is, you can find this both in the in the language in the Old and New Testament when they define it, and also as well as in dictionaries. To have hope is to expect with optimism, to have an optimistic expectation. Now, the other thing about hope, though, that makes it hope more than just wishing, because I wish something would happen rather than rather than I hope in something that will happen, is to have optimistic expectations with a firm confidence that the promise is going to be fulfilled. That's really the key here, especially to scriptural hope. And when we define hope in God, when we define hope that Jesus is our hope, when we talk about that, it's having that firm confidence in a promise that's going to be fulfilled. And so when we hold on to that, when we live for that hope, even in the midst of a disagreement, then it should give us something we can hold on to in common, saying whatever we disagree about, this thing, we are optimistic and we're unshakable, that we have such firm confidence in that promise being fulfilled that we're unshakable. Well, today, I've been, the last couple of weeks has been a couple of uh, stories. You know, we talked about uh, Ruth and Naomi. We talked about, um, oh, I even forgot who I talked about last week. Sorry about that. But uh, today, today, I want to talk about Paul. And if you read the book of Acts, there's a lot of his story, a lot of his, a lot of his journeys, his adventures. And, um, but he comes to, to some parts of that where he actually gets into some trouble, right? He, he's returned to Jerusalem, and much like Jesus, Paul goes through a series of trials that involve the temple scenario and the Jewish council and the Romans. And he has these series of trials where they're trying to figure out how to discredit and maybe even condemn and stop his message. And the Jews are unable to do that on their own, even though they're so offended by the message because it, it, really, it really butts up against what they've held on to as their truth. And so they count on the Romans to step in. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story kind of briefly, but I really want to lean into some scriptures that talk about hope and talk about the choices that uh, Paul had to make and the choices he made in the midst of disagreeing. So I'm just summarizing. I really encourage you to read the whole thing. It's like an action adventure novel. It's really gripping. Get a good modern translation and read it. Read the whole story. Don't just search the scriptures out for one verse here and one verse there that will give you an idea of how I should live the rest of my life. Read the whole story in context. I'm going to give you a brief synopsis. And here it is. Paul was led by, by God to return to Jerusalem. And so he did that. Well, when he came into Jerusalem, all the people uh, that were excited to see him who had joined in the cause that he was fostering, that they should believe in Jesus, but there were many who were not for that. And so he knew he had enemies. And so he went to the temple to purify himself, to follow the actual Jewish rites of purification. 
and uh, was in the process of that. It's a seven-day process, and he was doing that. And while he was doing that, he was also talking to the people about his encounters with Christ. He was telling his story. He was talking about who he had been before and then who he had become because of meeting the living Christ. And so uh, that's all going on. And then listen to what happens. And this is, I'm going to pick up the story and read some scripture to you. It's in uh, the book of Acts, uh, the 21st chapter, and maybe starting around the 27th verse. Um, and, and it's going to lead to his arrest. But listen to how this whole thing begins. When the seven days of purification were almost completed... The Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple. Now, why is it important to have the Jews from Asia? Because these were people who had seen him as he traveled throughout Asia and had seen and heard him as he had preached the gospel of Jesus and had turned people from the ancient traditional Jewish law-based to grace-based Christ followers. So they had seen that and they had seen the effect that it had had on their religious communities in other communities towns and cities of Asia. So now they were at the temple too. And so when they saw him in the temple, they stirred up the whole crowd and they laid hands on him and they cried out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere. Listen to this. He's teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. So they were upset because they had some disagreements about his teaching they were upset and they stirred up the emotions of the people to say he's teaching against what? Not teaching against God, teaching against the people and the laws and the temple. And the laws had by that time had become more something of the people and something of the temple and of the order of their society. And so he's stirring the whole thing up and they're getting their emotions worked up. And so there's this emotional stirring up this is social unrest beginning to form and so what happens a mob forms and they come to to lay hands on him they start beating him up actually and in order to stop that uh social unrest the authorities the ruling authorities which are the romans they get word of it and they rush in with the whole squadron of guys and they grab paul because that's what's going to stop the fighting and to the romans they don't want the social unrest the jews are using the concept of social unrest to uh, get rid of a guy who they have a theological disagreement with because it's challenging their order, their social order. So they're using a different method rather than just coming straight forward and having the debate and the dialogue about what's right, whether Jesus is the Messiah. They're using a social unrest. So it's a deflective kind of a thing. And they have a disagreement, but, but they're not, they're not, their hope is in what's of man and they want to keep what is. So he gets, gets removed, and time goes on, and, and they're and trying to figure out what's wrong with this guy. Finally, they bring him to the Jewish council. That's the next stop on the whole parade. Like, And just as much as Jesus had the same kind of a journey, they go to the Jewish council. So switch over now to chapter 23, Acts 23. And, and I'm going to pick up the story there from the scriptures in, um, in the sixth verse. And Paul has been brought before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. And listen to what happens. When Paul perceived that one part of the council were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. He even says it. He gets right to the point. He's not about to say, look, I'm stirring the people if that's not the point. This is the point. It's about the, what do we have our hope in? And do we believe in the resurrection of the dead? Well, that caused a great dissension among the Pharisees and Sadducees because they had two different schools of thought. It's almost like the two political parties about how do we solve the world's problems or two different denominational approaches to Scripture and to the church. How do we minister to man and minister to God? And so they took this disagreement and they had a big old argument about it. The Pharisees finally said, hey, he's one of us. In fact, he even called them brothers. And they said, wow, he's one of us. He even believes what we believe. We, should, we find no fault in him. We should let him go. But the Sadducees are like, no, no way. And so they kept the whole contention going. And see, the thing is, what Paul did in that moment was he didn't let himself get drawn into trying to solve the social unrest that was going on. He went straight to the key point, which is the truth, the way, Jesus. 
That's what I have my hope in. And if there's a resurrection of Christ, then there's a resurrection of us all, the just and the unjust. And there will be a day of judgment and the day of deliverance. Well, the Romans, again, with all this unrest, they couldn't even solve it in their own council. We give them a chance. They do not want the social order upset. They do not want the unrest that comes from that because from that is the potential of revolt. They, they don't want the current social order upturned either. They don't want any kind of battles or wars. They don't want to expend any more resources, people, money, time, etc. on tamping it down. They're going to be brutal and bring it down right now. Why? Because they're counting on levying taxes to all of those people that are subject to them. And from that is comes their living, their profits. The Romans are counting on the fact that our lives are good because we can subject these people and we can collect taxes. And so what do they do? In, an, in another case, just like they had previously done, they snatch Paul up and then they remove him because they're protecting Paul. But in a sense, they're keeping the order. If we can remove the problem, we can keep the social order, we can keep everything just as it is and everything will be great so now the whole thing with the trial and, and the court it basically goes on okay we couldn't solve it here so take it to the roman courts he's causing all this disruption and the jews are even say yeah take it to the roman courts we want to see that so now we got to go over to, to chapter 24 and paul like jesus before him is going to appear before a series of roman governors and they're going to try to figure out why is he even here and what has he done that's so bad. And he's going to have a chance to give his own testimony. So starting in verse 1 in chapter 24, listen to the story as it unfolds. After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. And they laid before the governor, that would be uh, Felix was his name. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him. And this is what Tertullus said. He said, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with gratitude. Now, did you catch all of that? Here they, they start with a point of contention around who should be worshipped and who should be trusted and is there resurrection. And now the Jews themselves, the high priest and his lawyer are coming and being thankful for the peace that the Romans have brought and for the reforms that the Romans have brought and how great that is, the works of man, right? Okay, verse 4. But detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world, all the world, and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. And then verse 9, the Jews also joined in this charge, affirming that all these things were so. So again, they, they brought a Roman trial, and they, and they came... To, to plead their case under Roman terms because the Romans don't want the peace violated. And so the Jews are saying, yeah, he's violating the peace. You should do away with him. They're not even bringing it up, this whole point about he disagrees with our laws and our systems of laws and our temple and the people that are in control. They're not, they're not actually contending the real disagreement. They just want to see if they can get rid of the guy who's got the truth, who is going to destroy their disagreement. All right. Verse 10. Here's Paul making his defense. Verse 10. When the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Basically, I've been peaceful the whole time I've been here. That's the charge against me, but I've been peaceful the whole time. Neither can they prove to you that what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, according to the way, the way, Jesus, which they call a sect, according to that way, I worship the God of our fathers, 
believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. So he's saying Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets, which Jesus himself proclaimed. Paul's saying, I worship according to the way. I worship the teachings that Jesus said, and I proclaim that it's true. All the law and the prophets. I agree with these guys. I don't have disagreement. I have agreement. I have a different way. And so all the, everything, believing everything laid down by the law and the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. And so I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and men. Now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. And while I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia... The jealous ones. They ought to be here before you and to make an accusation should they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing, I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am in trial before you this day. And so Paul pulls no punches. He says this is the point of disagreement. They wouldn't even be themselves bring it up because they knew that I worship what they worship. I hope for what they hope for. I follow the laws they put forward. I have purified myself and I have followed it perfectly. And so I guess the point is when there's disagreement, the key thing is going to be to find what truly are we disagreeing about? What's the truth of our disagreement? Are we uh, being deflected or distracted by other things? Are we, are we sacrificing for a temporary peace the eternal uh, firm confidence that we might have, the real hope? I, I would just end today's uh, brief time with you by saying, where do you place your hope? Is it in the social... Uh, 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 is it in solving the social unrest? through improving our temporary earthly structures? Or do you put your firm confidence in the only one who can fulfill the promise of eternal life? And I just pray today that you will turn towards Jesus. Join Paul in worshiping according to the way and find a hope that cannot be shaken. I bless you this day in Jesus' name. Amen.